This wonderful painting by Anders Zorn is largely about bounce light, light coming in from the window, hitting red fabric and other red things in the room, bouncing around and creating a red sensation, which ironically or strangely does not seem to affect the, the young women's faces. Renoir's paintings of fruit here are all about saturation. In fact, this looks like it was lit with sunset light. And that light would probably only last 10 or 15 minutes on this. So he had to somewhat make things up and paint really fast when doing this. This is not a remarkable painting. Uh, William Murchurst Chase did much more interesting paintings than this. Uh, but if I took the saturated flowers out of this and you did not have the blossoms anymore, all you would have left to look at pretty much is this shadow, which is not that interesting. So the blossoms are largely the content or the point of this painting. This very remarkable painting uh, is remarkable on a number of levels. Cer certainly the, the striking red band uh, for the horizon line is something you would rarely see and rarely see quite like that. These are the colors we see in California orange crate art. They are exaggerated colors and, and we enjoy their exaggeration for decorative reasons. But you might notice, as we've been talking about this for a little while, that the foreground of the painting is the exact opposite of the background. The foreground is gray and brown and filled with dead bones. And this caravan is reflected in a red-looking lake, which oddly seems to be reflecting the mountains rather than the sky, which makes a little bit more sense. So this seems like there's a, a narrative metaphor going on here, that these people may have left a vivid life behind them and are going towards death and destruction, and this is a precursor of their future. You may think I'm being a little bit extreme, but actually color is a very strong narrative tool, and saturation largely points to this idea of vitality. Uh, it is not always true, but more often than not. Now, this unusual painting, uh, unusual because we have a fight now between saturation and value. Your eyes are always going to go to the strongest dark light value in any painting. So in this case, as soon as this came up on the screen, most likely your eyes went right there because that is defined as the strongest edge, the strongest contour in this composition. But right away, your eyes went there and there's a good chance they stayed there a little while longer. This is, I can't help myself. I can't help myself. My eyes have to go there and I, can't, I, I cannot look at anything else. But we tend to want to dwell on the saturation here. And this expensive fabric, which has no challenger in this entire painting, is a great deal of the point. The, the frustration with this painting is, is it about her? Is it about them? Is it about their interaction? And it's not completely clear. This is a similar difficulty. We have a character on the left who is defined as being light against a dark background, and we have a character on the right who is defined as being more colorful than a dull background. That is a value situation. That is a saturation situation. Hue is the most difficult of all of these ideas to define. It's very easy to say value is dark light differences. Saturation is intensity or purity. But in the world of physics, hue is what you're looking at right here. It is the spectrum. Now, the problem with that as a definition of hue, as vibrations from the sun that we receive from our eyes on this planet, is that there's no brown, there's no pink, and there's no magenta in here. So it doesn't really help you as an artist very much to think of this as your toolbox because it doesn't really solve all, your, all of your color problems. Art schools teach that hue is made of the saturated colors on the outside of a color wheel. Now, this is an art school color wheel, 12 part color wheel. Um, we tend to think that that's what hues are. But what that does not normally include is this idea that everything on this line is the same hue as that dot. They are not different hues, they are the same hue. That entire line is a hue. This is a subtractor color wheel, so the line gets darker in the center and it gets lighter towards the outside, but that is the same hue in technical terms. So there's something frustrating about that, too, because this doesn't allow us to use pink. We have magenta now, but we don't have pink or brown in this. Well, in this painting, we have a wide variety of hues. And as I go around the painting and I point out a blue violet and a blue green and a yellow and a red orange, what I just gave you are color names. 
And color names are probably our best definition of what hue can be. That's probably the easiest way to handle this difficult subject of hue. In fact, when I've asked my students sometimes what is hue, they will say, well, it's the color of a color. And although it's not the best grammar, that is actually pretty accurate. That is, when you're talking to a client and they say, we need another color here, they're probably talking about hue. They're probably not talking about value and saturation. Lots of hues here. And in, uh, in earlier days of art and Middle Ages through to the Renaissance and even beyond, a lot of the job of an artist was to make ground up minerals from the earth that we now call paints, they become pigments, look as good as possible on a painted surface. In a sense, that is actually saying that a painting served the purpose not as a representation of the real world, but as a big flat jewel that you are taking things from the, from the ground, you are refining them so they look beautiful, and you are arranging them to create a higher degree of beauty. That is the way we talk about jewelry. So it is an, it's a stretch to call a painting a jewel, but the purpose of an artist was not to represent nature all the time. So you were seeing a lot of different colors here. Now, this was done before we had such a thing as color theory. This painting is hundreds of years old, but these are compliments. Yellow and purple are compliments. Red and green are compliments. These are a triadic harmony of yellow, red, and blue. These are ideas that eventually became codified, but they were still known by artists uh, hundreds of years ago. This, which is about 110 years old, this, this painting, is largely telling you um, that people walking on the street in Paris 100 years ago had many, many, many distractions. I'm not going to say this was TV, that's not really, that's stretching too far. But this was meant to be entertainment, and these were, these were much admired elements, these kind of posters. I'm showing this because hundreds of years ago it was not seemed proper to show hues next to each other that share too much information. You always wanted to create differences. Every time you put down another color, it was supposed to be very different than the color next to it. Uh, when we get to contrast, that is going to be called contrast of hue, but this is oranges and lemons, and they're very similar to each other. Not here. These are not similar to each other, and this is all about hue. That is actually, uh, somebody looking at this painting may, may refer to it later as that big colorful painting, as, as you would this too. This artist doing a portrait of his family and himself wanted to concentrate on very basic colors. They're not as basic here, but we still have those four basic colors of yellow, red, green and blue. I just said green because green I'm going to consider a psychological primary. So we do tend to accept it, expect it even, and it's going to appear in a wide variety of the paintings I'm going to be showing you too. A lot of different colors here. In fact, the, the artist made a big point of making sure that every part of this painting is devoted to another color and they're all given equal prominence. This blue violet, this red orange, this green, this soft violet, and this softer red orange, and even this the purple, although it's not a very successful purple, uh, and even to some extent the wing, the wing. Every area I just pointed to has an equal amount of visual weight. There's a problem with that. It, it does not help you, your eye, go look at this, but value helps to solve that problem. So we know that we're going we're to look at that first. A great many hues here. And that is actually, I think, the point of this painting, in a way, is to make sure that every part of it is devoted to another hue. Vincent van Gogh, known as a colorist, uh, loved bright hues, and he loved some of these new colors that were, that were available to artists in the 19th century for the first time. So we think of these as being bright colors all the time, but when we take out saturation and hue, and only have value left, those bright stars against a dark sky now have blended into a very similar value. So has everything in the town below blended into a similar value. Vincent van Gogh's paintings are often done at similar value because when you, when you work in similar value, you start noticing the, the exceptions. And when you're putting different colors next to each other, 
And dark and light value is not the big, the first thing that you take away from that experience. Then you, you start appreciating the differences in hues. This last painting, this famous bedroom painting, uh, when I, when I desaturate this, certainly we're not going to see the same kind of effect. Actually, yes, we do. This lightness, the lightness of these bed sheets and the darkness of the frames are the only exception. The bed, the blanket, the floorboards, the table, the chair, the wall, walls, the door are all very similar in value. I give an assignment to my students to help them understand these differences between hue, value, and saturation and how they can be used and especially how they can be used to help tell a story. In this first example that you're seeing, I have asked the student to use value to create a situation in this composition. And I've also asked that they repeat the composition and reinterpret it using saturation. So we have a couple and we recognize right away that there is a couple there because our eyes go to that strong dark line against a light background. But in this one, and all the hues are the same by the way, but the saturation has changed and some of the values have changed. So now through saturation you actually have a different situation and a different couple and this is very nicely done. In this last one, you no longer have value differences, you no longer have saturation differences, you now only have hue differences. This is not the way we work in the world. We don't like images that don't have value differences. It upsets people. It doesn't give the visual cortex anything to work with and we get very uncomfortable with this. But this does help you understand the differences between these three kinds of contrasts. In this other example, we have a man who you see very easily because his dark beard and boat define his yellow slicker um, as the thing you're supposed to look at. But in this next image, you realize that no, his situation with his uh, fishing, he's having an extremely bad day fishing, uh, is actually the content, is actually the point of this. It has been reinterpreted. And this is no value differences, no saturation differences. More to the point in many ways here, uh, because this is a potential story. We have a lot of elements to deal with here. I have a tent. I have two women. I have a light. I have something on the ground that could very well be somebody face down on the ground. Hard to notice. And we have a silhouette in the lower right hand corner. All these things together do not give us a sense of closure. We don't really know how to, to create glue to actually put these together and understand what's going on. But it does get our interest and our interest goes straight to the light source and to the two women because that is the strongest dark light difference. But now it goes straight to the saturation. The blood on the ground has now revealed that this person in the corner may not have been the villain, but maybe these women have done something that they really would rather not anybody know about. In this case, we no longer have value differences. We no longer have very strong saturation differences. It's harder to do in paint, but you do learn more. It's a very, very good version of this assignment. I'm very glad to be able to show it to you. This is also very charming and good. This is uh, actually Ghosts of Christmas, I think he wanted to call this. And that's what you're seeing. You are seeing the ghost of, of Christmas, but here we're not concentrating on the ghosts. We're concentrating on the things, the signifiers, that let us know that it is Christmas. And this is accurate. As strange as that may seem, it is accurate. It's a very good job.